Welcome back in. Appreciate all of you hanging out with us as we roll through the Tuesday edition of OutKick. Join now by a national champion head coach, Scott Drew of Baylor University. And does that get old to hear? And did you really ever believe you would hear it? I know what you said. Does it still feel a little bit uh, like a surreal universe that you hear that now, coach? Well, it's only been about two weeks, but I could get used to this. So, yeah, I love hearing that, and it's a great it's a great honor and recognition for uh, the players and what they were able to achieve. And as a coach, it's kind of like a parent. On Christmas Day, when you see your kids opening up a present, everybody's excited, you're happy. And uh, to see all Baylor Nation, uh, Central Texas, Waco, uh, the state of Texas, only our second basketball championship, the last one they did a movie on in 1966. So uh, exciting time in Texas right now. Okay, so I want to take you back before we go to the national championship game. When you took over in 2003, we came on the day after you win the championship and say, this is not just a remarkable story for basketball. This is one of the all-time accomplishments. I'm trying to do it off the top of my head. I knew all the data. Uh You'll probably know them better than me. I think since 1950, Baylor had been to the NCAA tournament once in 1988 Uh, When you took over, you were on probation. Uh, Obviously, uh, many people know uh, about the uh, the awful incident, the murder that was involved in Baylor basketball. Did you, when you took over in 2003, and I think it took you four years to get to a winning record, did you Mm -hmm. ever have doubts and think maybe this is not going to work? Take me back to 2003, (laughs) 2004, 2005, 2006, before – everything really starts to get rolling and you start at least making the NCAA tournament? Yeah, great question. So I can equate this to anyone that's opened a new business or restaurant, and you are so busy in the beginning doing what you're doing. You're really not – you don't have time to get too frustrated or upset because you, you're, you're moving on to the next issue or the next problem. So with us, we get to campus and we only have between five and seven scholarship players throughout the year because academically we had some guys out at different times. So the first thing we had to do was go all over campus and try to find at least a half, half a team full of walk-ons that can fill our roster. Now, talk about a great deal. Not only could you walk on, but you actually could play. So, I mean, that, that, that was pretty good. So we have our opening tryout. We have a lot of people show up. And, and you know what? We walked out of the gym. We're like, dang, there's some good-looking athletes. we got some height. We call everyone over, and we ask, all right, so where, what year are you at Baylor? Where do you live? And all of a sudden, a hand goes up and says, wait a minute, you got to go to school at Baylor to be on the team? We're like, yeah. <laughs> so, so hence, people that drove down from Dallas, from the junior colleges and all over Central Texas thinking they could be on the team without going to school. Most of them left. We were left with what's normal, the six-foot walk-on. And uh, uh, we, we filled out our roster that way. That year, we actually won three conference games, did not finish last, so it was a, it was a blessing. And then the next year was really tough. It was more the rebuilding year because it was too late to bring in any recruits because when we took over, most of them had already committed. And then the third year was when the NCAA actually took away our non-conference schedule. So that was when the penalties all came down. So we just played a regular season. We're the only school to ever do that, by the way. Yeah, so that's if anyone ever did that, yeah. Yeah, I looked at your at your coaching record, and I was like, "What in the yeah. world happened that year?" I had to go back and research it that you only yeah. played conference <laughs> basketball. Yeah, so so if anyone's ever in that situation, we're the only ones with uh, experience, so we can help you with that. But I can tell you what was so hard with that is imagine practicing all the way from August until January, basically. And then when you play, you're expecting to have the success, and then you're terrible because it's kind of like a freeway. You know, in Texas, speed limit 75, everybody's zooming, and now you're getting on the ramp at conference play, and you're going yeah. 40, 50, 60, trying to catch up. So that was a tough year. And then the the, the next year, what's, what's, what's amazing, five years later, you make the NCAA tournament. And that was the story in itself because we were the last team called. So we had a big uh, celebration party. The Farrell Center's packed on the floor. So we got all these people here, and we get through the whole bracket, and they're down to one team to be called. And I never in my wildest dreams thought we weren't going to be called because uh, uh, Joe Lenardi said we were in. You know, and if he says yeah. you're in, you're in, right? Yeah, so Joey Brackett says we're good, and all of a sudden you're thinking, if they don't call us, what are we telling everybody? And then we're the last name called. The place erupts. 
We get in the NCAA tournament. Then we go to two Elite Eights, 2010, 2012. And God's plan is always perfect because I'd have had us go to the Final Four then. But, you know, then you don't appreciate it as much. And, you know, and, and, you, and you don't realize what a blessing it is when you do make it to a Final Four. And then, obviously, we won the national championship this year. What does it feel like to lose an Elite Eight game? Well, not only is it tough to lose, but then you got to watch that team cut down nets, celebrate. And in both instances, for us, Duke ended up winning the national championship in 2010, and Kentucky won it in 2012. So you're sitting there thinking, man, we could have won a national championship. And, right. And, that, 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 and, and, and when you get – like, you make it to the Sweet 16, you have a full week to enjoy it, and you get a lot of media attention. When you make it to the Final Four, you have a full week to enjoy it and a lot of media attention. So losing the Elite Eight is really hard because, you know, most, most, most college coaches, their goal and dream is always to be in the Final Four. Most players, their dream is to be in the Final Four, to be that close and not get there. And that's why when we got there this year, it was that much more of a, a blessing because our staff realized how hard it is to get there. When did you start to realize and make recruits aware of Baylor as a viable option? So I know you you mentioned early on you're not even able, you get the probation, you're not able to play an out-of-conference. When was, was there a moment when you went into a home or you talked to some recruits and you started thinking, okay, we're starting to get a little bit of momentum. People know that we're a player on a relatively high level, was there a moment like where it kind of shifted for you? Because you talked about it's like starting mm-hmm. a business, and it's so hard initially. Because and and there are a lot of people I'm sure listening to us who know what that's like. Because there's so many things that you're trying to fix simultaneously that you don't really have the mm-hmm. time to be like, hey, here's my five year plan, here's my three year plan. Right. You're like, I just got to get through uh-huh. today. I got to get through this week. <laughs> uh, when do, when do you start being able to plan and build and think, okay? we're starting to get a little bit of a foundation and recruits are becoming aware of us. Well, we, we were able to attract some good recruits early on. Aaron Bruce from Australia was a, 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 a freshman All-American. Mamadou Gian was a seven-footer from, from uh, uh, Senegal, and he was our first recruit. But really it was that, year, that third year when we brought in uh, Curtis Gerald's from Austin, who was uh, highly touted, and then Henry Dugat from Houston that was highly touted, and Kevin Rogers from Dallas that was highly touted. So you get three recruits across the state that are all name-recognized, uh, 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 worthy, and, 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 and high-level players to where, wait a minute, they're going to Baylor? So if they're going to Baylor, I need to consider Baylor. And that recruiting class in the state of Texas kind of uh, uh, got us going. And then we brought in our first McDonald's All-American in Tweedy Carter. And then from there, uh, the program kind of just grew because since 2008, only Kansas and us in the Power Five have won 18 or more games a year. And in the last five years, only us, Kansas, Duke, and Gonzaga have been ranked in the top, uh, have been ranked number one three of the last five seasons or more. So we've, we've had success since 2008. We've had elite success uh, in the last couple of years. And we're the winningest team in the Power Five in the last two years. Uh, a lot of success, and obviously COVID didn't allow us to have a chance to go to a Final Four last year or play in the NCAA tournament, which made everybody appreciate it that much more this year. You won the national championship this year. Would you consider this to be your best coaching job, or do you think one of those other years where you didn't have the same success at the end of the season was Mm -hmm. your best coaching job? That's another great question. What what I would tell you is we ask our players to improve every year, and – I'm hoping our coaching staff does the same thing. So hopefully I'm better now than I was several years ago. And hopefully next year I'm better than I was this year. So uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's the goal. If you could go back to 2003 and talk to yourself, what do you think you know to that extent you're getting a little bit better hopefully every year at what you do? And I imagine a lot of people out there listening to us right now try to do that in their own profession What do you think would have been the most interesting and helpful bit of advice you could have given yourself in 2003 that you had no clue about now, but you have come to learn in the ensuing 18 years? Man, you're you're asking some deep questions today. (laughs) I would probably, first of all, first of all, I would have probably said, enjoy having hair because it's going to come out real quick in the next couple of years. That's number one. All right. Uh, uh, The the other thing is, uh, um, the, as we get older, life really speeds up, 
And and I would I, I looking back, I wish I'd uh, spent a little more time with with my kids when they were little. To be honest, and yeah, you spend so much time working, and you spend so much time trying to build a program, and next thing you know, um, I got a seventeen year old, a thirteen year old, and a ten year old. My wife's done an amazing job uh, uh, because she's been there most of the time when I've been traveling and gone. But uh, probably probably enjoy that time a little bit more, and I'd have probably scheduled a little bigger break during Christmas time so that you could spend a little more time with the family. Uh, that, that, that's something. <laughs> How, I mean, that's, that's good advice, I think, for a lot of people with young kids. In fact, I'm coaching uh, and have been coaching a lot with kids, and it's interesting because as you get older, the college kids seem younger, right? I'm sure when you started coaching in 2003, yeah. you felt a little bit more like a contemporary to them. Now you just said you got a 17-year-old. I'm sure you look at them very much as your own kids. And so I'm curious from a coaching perspective, Bas- college basketball season is extremely long. This year with COVID, mm-hmm. it was even more crazy than it ordinarily would be. How do you balance out when to go hard on them, when to go soft on them? And in particular, when you were dealing with the COVID shutdown you guys had and you had to miss some games, mm-hmm. and then you came back and you weren't necessarily playing at your peak level, how do you hit the right note to get them playing at a peak level by the time the tournament comes around? Well, so so is it art or teams, science in your mind? I guess from a coaching perspective. Uh, well, I, I, some of it is, is is your feel, and some of it is your experience on your team. Like with us, this was a player led team. We had a lot of experienced players that were veterans that were that were professionals. And what I mean by that is they came into the gym and they wanted to get better. They wanted to be pushed. Other times you have a, a more inexperienced team that are more your freshmen and sophomores, and, and there you tend to have less consistency. So you have more ups and downs, and there you gotta you gotta keep them fresher because the grind of the season will wear them out a lot quicker than a, than a 22, 23 year old who's used to it. Uh, so with with. With, with us, I, I can tell you that uh, I'm energetic. Our staff's energetic. We want it to when you come into the gym, you're excited to be in the gym, not, oh, gosh, I got to get, I gotta get uh, 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 yelled at for the next two or three hours today. We want guys that want to come in the gym. They want to get better. And at the same time, we try to make it fun because we spend most of our time with them in the gym. So uh, as far as when you're hard on them, when you're not, I think it's, it's a consistency they want. And um, with us, I mean, when they, when they screw up, we're going to hold them accountable. But it's not a demeaning thing. It's a corrective thing that they should want to get better. And the accountability part's really more than anything. Because with this generation, it's not telling them what you know. It's telling them why they need to know it. Because if they understand the importance of it, they're going to do it 100%. And sometimes, as coaches, we just think, you tell them to do this and they got to do this without explaining why they got to do it. So we're constantly trying to remind ourselves to explain the why so they can buy in with it. We're talking to Baylor men's basketball coach uh, Scott Drew, now a national champion coach. Last year, when suddenly the rug gets pulled out from underneath your team, you had a really good team last year too. What did that feel like for your team when suddenly the NCAA tournament is no more? Well, I, I, I tell you, uh, the coaches I talked to all had the same feeling, and that is, you think about it, most college kids aren't going to be in the NBA. Most college kids spend most of their uh, young life working for an opportunity to reach the, the, the top of the, the platform, and that is uh, the pinnacle is the NCAA tournament. And like for our seniors, Freddie Gillespie that didn't get a chance – Devontae Bandu, who didn't get a chance. We had a walk on Obim that didn't get a chance to play in it. I mean, your heart goes out to him. It's one of the toughest things that us coaches had to do, uh, saying that there is no NCAA tournament. Now, the blessing for us, most of our guys came back, and they all remembered that feeling of not having an opportunity last year. So we were all that much more excited for this year, and that's why we couldn't thank the NCAA enough for having the bubble and making it a safe environment, which we could play the NCAA tournament. And I know it, 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 the restrictions are, are, are not what everyone's used to, but we were just so excited to be in the bubble and wanted to stay in the bubble and be a part of March Madness because when we didn't have the opportunity the year before, we really were blessed and, and appreciative of it this year. And again, this is a memory that lasts a lifetime and especially for a lot of a lot of people that this is the end of their basketball career because most people don't play professional basketball 
We're talking to Baylor national champion coach Scott Drew. So when you finish uh, and beat Houston and you have a 48-hour window basically to turn around and get ready for the national championship game, did you watch the game between Gonzaga and UCLA? Were you scouting it? What is – I'm, I'm fascinated by – that window, that quick turnaround? Had you already scouted everything else during the course of that week so you didn't really have much to do? You win, you know you're in the national championship game. Your life looks like what for the next 48 hours? So we, we, first of all, most staffs you break down and, and one coach will have the team you're playing as a scout and then the other two coaches will take, one will take uh, UC, uh, uh, UCLA, one will take Gonzaga and then once the, once you know who's you're playing well that that person has most of the scout done maybe 80 percent of it done and then they add what they saw in the last uh game played with me what, what i tend to do is like synergy breaks everything down you can watch them against zone you can watch them against man the press offense press defense and to me I, i'm not going to waste time watching a game live because uh there's too many interruptions and it takes too long yeah so right away you're looking you're you're you're, you're starting to focus on your team first so I wanted to watch our game versus Houston, see where we could get better, how we could improve. And then once I knew who we were playing, then start to start to watch all those breakdowns and then watch the last game they played because obviously you can fast forward all the dead periods. So now it becomes a 40-minute game instead of a two-hour game. And when, you're, when you have a small window, it's important not to waste time. So how nervous are you, and what would you uh, say of your team's overall perspective and pers- persona as you walk out and get ready to play on that Monday? Well, it, 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 it's different in the bubble from the standpoint when you, when you go to a game and there's only 10% or 25%, it's nothing like when there's 100% and fans are all over right. and, and, and so much louder. Um, by that time of the year, we had actually gotten pretty used to uh, being in venues that were, were 10% full or 25% full. So uh, it, it was a lot easier to keep your players' attention because normally in an NCAA tournament, you play two rounds, you come back to campus, campus is going crazy, everybody's trying to uh, congratulate them and then you're you're not able to practice as much because you're traveling so that affects your time to practice where when you're in the bubble i mean you you come back and how you celebrate it you go to the team room with the with with your team so (laughs) it's real simple you eat you get up the next day you watch some film you get ready for practice and you can you can really uh 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 keep their attention and you're able to really do a lot more. So uh, you're, you're not overwhelmed by the national championship game as you might be, I guess, in a normal situation with us. Uh, we, we had, we had, we were set to play Gonzaga on December 5th, had so much respect for coach few and his team. And then that game got, uh, uh, uh canceled. And as we were disappointed at that time, cause it was one verse two, but you know what? God had a better plan. He said, we ain't going to do this on December 5th. We're going to do this on April 5th. And coach few and I agreed. We said, if we meet back here and make this game on April 5th, we are good with that. And, and that's what, that's what ended up happening. And they had an unbelievable season and uh, coach Few's a hall of fame coach does a tremendous job. Uh, but I know, I, I know we had a bunch of guys that are competitors and they want to play against the best. So they were excited to play against Gonzaga. How did you? I know you celebrated with your team. You're in Indianapolis. I saw the footage of everything that happened on Baylor. I guess they were out on the football field, storming the football field and everything else, <laughs> having an incredible time watching you guys play. What was it like to finally return to campus, having won the national championship? As you mentioned, you guys were in the bubble at Indianapolis. And what has it been like in the state of Texas since you returned? So, so the game finishes, we're able to see our, our, our families, and that, that was such a blessing because for the last three, four weeks we hadn't been able to since we got to Indianapolis. And actually in the Big 12 tournament, we were in a bubble, so not able to give hugs and, and, and see our little ones. But uh, once, once the game was over, you spent time with family, and after about 3, 4 in the morning, you go back to your hotel room, and then you got your 1,000-plus text messages, and right away you start to try to answer those. And then the next thing is you got the morning 
these shows. So why would you fall asleep for 30 minutes or an hour? You know, you haven't pulled an all-nighter since you were 30 years ago in college, so you might as well stay awake now. So then then you uh, uh, finish that in and, and the morning shows, and then you leave to come back. You land. There's a big gathering at the airport for you. You're excited about that. You go home. You crash that night. And then uh, – and then, and then, Ever since then, you get up and uh, you have opportunities to talk to uh, great people like uh, uh, you and your show and everybody else uh, uh, across America and, and brag about your guys. And it doesn't get much better than that because uh, what they achieved this year is is remarkable and special. And first championship uh, 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 in Baylor history. And like you said, first Big 12 championship since 1950, first Final Four since uh, uh, 1950 as well. Baylor men's basketball coach, national champion, Scott Drew. I know how busy you have been, Coach. I appreciate you coming on with us early this morning, and we look forward to talking to you again somewhere down the line. Sounds great. Take care. Thank you for all you do. Thanks a lot. That is Baylor national champion men's basketball coach, Scott Drew. 